Today we're carrying on, continuing our studies uh, in John, uh, the series entitled Jesus in John. Um, you might have last week's slide, because it's, it's actually a slightly different reading uh, than the one up there. It's, it's uh, John chapter 1, verse 43 to 51. Um, I believe Simone is going to very kindly read for us. Simone, over to you. to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite, in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Thank you, Simona. Uh, may God add his blessing to his word. Uh, I was quite relieved to see those words come up on the screen. I had a horrible thought that I'd prepared entirely the wrong passage. Um, turns out we're on track. Now I often like to start my sermons by seeing who recognises an, an obscure date from history. Today is no exception. Uh, I see some people here will know it. Can anyone tell what happened on July the 20th, 1969? The Americans should know this. Show of hands. Any, any guesses? Yes, Eric, you know this today. Moon landing, indeed. First man on the moon in 1969. My parents, that's one of their first like TV memories. 650 million people followed it. Some more events that have even bigger followers. Does anyone know the, the top three most followed sporting events? Any guesses? What do you think? World Cup. World Cup is number one. Anyone know number two? Have a guess. Super Bowl. Super Bowl, not even top ten. Number two is the Tour de France. Three and a half billion people watch that. And number three, Cricket World Cup. Yeah. There we go, Cricket World Cup. I thought one of our Indian brothers would know that. A few weeks ago, um, I was glued to my phone, as were a few of the people, uh, following Ruin and uh, Simon as they did the vassal upper, as they struggled through the, the slush and the ice. Over this weekend, those who are into running, uh, may have been following the, the Barclay Marathons, uh, the, the first woman ever to complete uh, the, this ridiculous race was this weekend. Of course, there's many other ways we can follow things. We followed each other on Facebook. Then Twitter came along, we could follow what our favorite celebrities had for breakfast and other earth shatteringly important things. Instagram came, we could follow even more about our favourite celebrities. People who weren't even celebrities became famous and we followed them diligently. As you see on any train, everybody's following lots of people. For those who run, you've got Strava, you can follow slash stalk what people are up to. There's just so many ways of following. It seems in recent years, there's just so many different ways to follow people. We've seen the rise of the influencer. We've seen Twitch streams, where you watch someone playing games become more popular than playing games. I can't get my head around that, to be honest. But it seems we have this strong urge to follow. Last week we heard how Jesus is God. Jesus is fully man. 
fully God. We saw the first disciples begin to follow him. This passage is all about more people beginning to follow Jesus. It started with his brothers, Andrew and Peter, then Philip, then Nathaniel. And at this point, there were four people following Jesus. Now we have hundreds of millions of people. Depends how you kind of count it. Obviously, there's, we, we know there's, you can say you're a Christian, but it just means you kind of went to church, or you can really follow Jesus. But it, by even the most conservative estimates, there's 600 million people who follow Jesus. It seems our urge to follow can lead us to follow the right thing, or it can lead us to follow the wrong thing. What can we learn from this passage about following Jesus? Sometimes I think it's, it's worth reflecting when we look at one of the Gospels. Why was this written? John states very clearly, uh, later on in John 20, these words are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Remember, John was that. John was the disciple who really, one of three, spent more time with Jesus than anyone else. He's referred to as the disciple that Jesus loved. He writes a lot about relationships. He writes extensively about the Last Supper, the last few moments that Jesus spent with his followers. So it's very important to John, and it should be very important to us, following Jesus. Before we dive into that, I want to address just a, there's a little strange bit in the middle of this passage. I want to address that first and then move on to a few things. There's these, these words where um, Philip tells Nathaniel about Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel goes, Nazareth? Anything good come from there? Did a little bit of research. Um, apparently, Nazareth was this tiny little town. And uh, so saying, so, so Nazareth was, this was almost like saying, it's all just, you know, country bumpkins come from there. I tried to find what was the equivalent in Sweden, but it seems every part of Sweden looks down on somewhere else. Stockholm looks down on Gothenburg. People in Gothenburg call Stockholm the backside of Sweden. Maybe in the States, you kind of look down on people from the deep south. In the UK, they like to laugh at northerners which is where I'm from. But Nazareth, Nazareth was kind of that equivalent. The part of the country, people kind of look down on a little bit. But often Jesus goes against expectations, doesn't he? So when Nathaniel says this, Philip says, come and see. Come and see this good thing that comes from Nazareth. Today I want to talk about four things about following Jesus, plus a couple of, uh, a couple of bonus items. First thing, Jesus knows those who follow him. We read from this passage, these only short verses, Jesus seems to know quite a bit about Nathaniel. He describes him as a true Israelite, a true follower in whom there is nothing false. Jesus, of course, had divine wisdom, divine power, divine knowledge. He saw him when he was under the fig tree. He saw what he was doing even before he met Jesus. And it's the same with us. If we follow Jesus, Jesus, we can be assured, Jesus knows our heart. Jesus knows what we've been through. Jesus has been through it himself. Jesus has experienced the trials, the tribulations. Jesus has been persecuted. Jesus has been attacked. Jesus has felt alone. All the things that we struggle with, Jesus has struggled with them first. Jesus knows those who follow him. He knows every hair on your head. He knows every part of your body, every detail of your life. And it struck me, it's, that's very different. Again, I'm, I'm not going to go on a rant about following people on Instagram. But whilst we probably don't really know them, they don't know us at all, do they? I, I <laughs> I follow someone called Henry the Colorado Dog, which is a dog that hikes in the Colorado, in the Rocky Mountains, uh, with a cat, uh, and a gnome, I guess. Um, Henry the Colorado Dog does not know me at all. 
Uh, who else do I follow? I don't really follow anyone that interesting. But none of them know me. And maybe, so maybe we follow a musician and we think, oh yeah, they really speak to what I'm going through and we love them. And that's great. But they don't know you. It's all about the person you're following. When we follow someone on Instagram or, or where else, it's about them. If we follow Jesus, Jesus knows us, Jesus cares for us, Jesus loves us. I quite like watching these like, documentaries about hiking and things like that. And often they do this amazing thing where they start with Google Earth. So this is like the planet and then they go and they zoom right the way in to this like campsite that somebody set up. I kind of think, God, Jesus, it's a bit like that. They're the rules of all, they are in complete control. The creator of the universe, on high, most powerful. And yet it's like they can zoom in on our lives. They zoom in onto our, our hearts, our needs, our desires. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Well, come and see. Because Jesus knows those who follow him. The second thing we see from this passage is that those who follow Jesus know him. Just as Jesus knows those who follow him, those who follow Jesus know him. And the gospel is actually full of the disciples kind of gradually getting to know Jesus. Not just his character, but his very divine nature. And there's already some glimpses here. Nathaniel declares, Rabbi, which kind of means teacher, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. And as we go through the gospel, we see Jesus revealed more and more fully to his disciples. They understand him more. The gospel presents Jesus as he is. We see everything about him. There's actually a passage in one of the gospels where Jesus talks about what a privilege this is for us. He describes us as greater than all those who have gone before because we know Jesus. We have the privilege of the gospels. We see what he did for us. We have his teachings. As a follower of Jesus, we can know everything about him. Later in John chapter 10, Jesus is talking to those who they question him and they question his followers. And Jesus says this, the works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe me because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. The Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. We can know Jesus. We can know Jesus in an intimate, intimate way. But I wonder, sometimes as we approach Easter, maybe one of the things that can get in the way a bit can be almost, we can almost be too familiar with Jesus. We can become complacent. We can forget just what a remarkable person Jesus is, Jesus was. We can forget what he did. I'm very conscious it's the, the week before Easter. And sometimes we can think of Easter as kind of almost like this, um, like going through the motions. You know, it's just kind of a, a role play. God said to Jesus, let's, let's just kind of, we'll put him across, it's just a nice image nice metaphor. People will kind of understand the idea, you've done wrong, needs punishment, someone's punishment, that's you, job done, I'll go back to heaven. And we can really downplay it, can't we? But Jesus went to the cross for us. Jesus went willingly. Jesus suffered unimaginably. I just want to dwell just a little bit. I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes about suffering. Uh, sorry about that, but it's it's important to, I think, to understand just how real this was for Jesus. And remember, whenever you, whenever you suffer, what's, what's part of the worst thing is knowing you can't necessarily do anything about it. If you're in pain, you don't know how to stop it. Jesus could have stopped it, just like that. When Jesus was suffering on the cross, he could have stopped it instantly. He could have stopped it at a moment's notice. Oh, this is not worth it. 
this is too much. This needs to stop. Because this was very real. Jesus sweat drops of blood just thinking about what he was going to have to do. The physical pain of the cross is one of the most painful things a human can endure. There's lengthy descriptions of exactly what goes on in the human body. I won't go into too much detail, but just imagine you're hanging. Just hold your arms out for 10 minutes. Just supporting their own weight. It's painful. Jesus was hanging by his arms. Every breath was a struggle. Every breath was an agony. It was such a cruel way of killing someone that it was actually banned for Roman citizens. It was seen as too barbaric to do to your own. Jesus went through that for us. Sometimes perhaps we only see the cross as a physical pain. And this was a real thing. And a Calvary on the cross. The Bible is very clear. Jesus became sin for us. Jesus didn't pretend that he was taking our sin. Jesus became sin for us. Jesus took our sin. Those things we've done that keep us from God, those things we know we still do. Jesus took them on him. It was as if they were his own. The guilt you feel. We all do things wrong. We all slip. We all stumble. We all sin. And we feel guilt. Imagine that guilt as a perfect human being. Fully man. Fully God. And in that moment you have the guilt of everyone's sin through eternity. Imagine that suffering. That was only half of it. Because at that moment, Jesus took the wrath of God. Jesus took the punishment. Jesus took the punishment so that we don't have to. He felt the full force of God's wrath beating down on him. It's a very poor analogy. But when I was at school, we had a German teacher called Mr. Fluker. And he was an ex-policeman. He, he was a big lad. I don't know, I was, I was a kid. But he seemed enormous. He's a big man, built like that. And I remember once, I, I, was, I, don't know, I was late with my homework or something, and he had this habit. He'd, tell, he'd make you stay back. I don't think you can do this anymore. You certainly don't do it this week. He'd stand you in the corner. He'd put his face, like, that far from you. And he'd just shout at you about what a miserable, lazy, hopeless, useless, good-for-nothing you were. You can imagine, as a, as a 14 year old, this was terrifying. I felt he was just itching to rip me limb from limb, tear my arms off, beat me over the head with them. He just, for that moment, it felt like he hated me. I felt his wrath. I say that's just a poor analogy of what God thinks about sin. And at that moment on the cross, Jesus took the full wrath of God. Again, they weren't pretending. This wasn't a role play. Jesus became sin for us. But probably the worst part of the cross, probably the most significant, is that at that moment Jesus was completely alone. He cries out on the cross, doesn't he? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As Jesus became sin for us, that we might live, he was alone. For the first time in eternity, he did not have the Father. He was not connected in that perfect unity because he was our sin. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see. If you follow Jesus, if you know him, if you know what he did, if you meditate on that amazing love he had for us, you'll know something good came from Nazareth. Third thing we see is that those who follow Jesus will see great things. Verse 49, you see Nathaniel was, was rightly impressed. Jesus seemed to know about him. He'd seen him under the fig tree. And then Jesus says, you shall see greater things than that. As a prediction, that came pretty true, didn't it? If you followed Jesus around for these few years, what did you see? You saw great miracles. You saw water turn into wine. You saw the 5,000 fed from a few loaves and a few fishes. Fishes, fish. You saw Jesus heal the sick. You saw Jesus die on a cross and rise again. 
You heard these great teachings and Nathaniel certainly saw great things from following Jesus. But it's the same for us. If we follow Jesus, we will see great things. We'll see his works on earth. We'll see amazing testimonies like the one we've heard today. We'll see amazing coincidences happen. The more we pray, the more coincidences seem to happen. We'll see the power of God working through Jesus Christ on earth. We'll see people's lives and hearts transformed, including our own, if we follow Jesus. But even more amazing, if we follow Jesus, we'll see just incredible things in eternity. We'll see a new heaven and a new earth. We'll see a perfect paradise with him. It's described for us briefly in, in Revelation. The writer says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. If we follow Jesus, we will see these things. We'll see this wonderful creation restored, perfect once again. And we'll see Jesus as we've never seen him. We'll understand how much he loves us. We'll understand what he did for us. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see. Final thing I want us to see is that those who follow Jesus urge others to follow him. This has been a theme in both this passage and the one last week, we see people finding Jesus, following Jesus, saying to others, we found him, come and find him. I wonder, do we encourage others with the same sense of urgency? It's fantastic to hear about street, street evangelism. That's, that's one way of encouraging others to follow Jesus. And it's a great way, because you'll meet people you probably never meet otherwise. But it's not the only way. It's not the reserve of, of just those out on the street. It's not just for those who feel called to do that. You can urge others to follow Jesus in daily life. Daily conversations, your colleagues, your friends, your family. Are you urging others to follow Jesus? And we mustn't just see this as like, if we know, you know, if we're Christians, this is just for those who aren't Christians. Are you urging your brothers and sisters in Christ to follow him? Are you asking each other how is God blessing you? How is God speaking to you? How are you following him? How can I pray for you? How can I encourage you to follow him more? Are you urging others to follow Jesus? Because if you don't, let me urge you now. If you don't follow Jesus, if you don't know him as your saviour, if you haven't had that moment where you recognise that you have things that keep you from God, that you have sins in your life that are not dealt with. Because you can't deal with them by just going, I'm not going to do them anymore. Because firstly, they're still not dealt with, and secondly, you won't manage on your own. So if you haven't put your trust in Christ, if you haven't asked him forgiveness, repentant, let me urge you now, Follow him. Find out more about him. Put your trust in him. Give your life to him. If that's not clear, if that's confusing, do please speak to me afterwards because the most important thing I can do today is urge you to follow Jesus. Because the answer to can anything good come from Nazareth is resoundingly, overwhelmingly yes. Because Jesus came from Nazareth. He came to earth. He died that we might live. Just a couple of bonus items, as I think we've got time. Firstly, just a, a word of caution. We've talked a couple of times about false teachers and about uh, false prophets and, and wolves coming among sheep. 
And some will dress up following themselves as following Jesus. And they'll quote scripture and they'll quote Jesus. And that's great. But when you dig deep, they're actually encouraging you to follow them. So I would urge you to be very cautious of those whose emphasis gradually becomes follow them. If my concluding message was, come follow me and I'll tell you all about Jesus, that's the wrong emphasis. You shouldn't be following anyone. You should be following Jesus. So watch for those who will disguise their message. Will kind of wrap it in a false shroud. Pretend that they're telling you to follow Jesus, but they're actually telling you to follow them. Don't follow others, follow Jesus. And another word of caution. This is not easy. Again, I wish I could say that follow Jesus and everything on earth will be perfect. You'll be rich, you'll be happy, you'll be blessed, you'll be better looking somehow. Those are not the promises. Jesus' first disciples, they had tough old lives. Most of them were persecuted, the majority of them were killed. There's no guarantees that this life on earth is easier for following Jesus. But it will be a life lived with him. It'll be a life lived with brothers and sisters in Christ. And it'll be an eternity spent with him in heaven. It's not easy, but the rewards are more than worth it. But how do you follow Jesus? How do you follow him? He doesn't have an Instagram page. Well, there's a very funny, like, fake. I was going to start with memes, but it can always go horribly wrong. But it's a very funny, like, if Jesus had an Instagram account thing. But he doesn't have one. But there are many ways you can follow him. Follow him, first of all. Follow his teaching. Follow both the teachings of Jesus and the whole teachings of the Bible, which all point us to him. Read what Paul says as he expands on what Jesus said. Read the teachings of Jesus. Follow his teachings. But follow his example. Follow Jesus' example. Ultimately, it's impossible. We cannot live the life that Jesus lived. But if we attempt it, if we try to be more like Jesus, if we think to ourselves, it's big in the 80s, it's like, what would Jesus do? We all had armband with WWJD. I hope we make a return, actually, but what would Jesus do if we try and follow his example? If we try and daily be like Jesus, we can follow him like that. But most of all, I would urge you to follow him closely. This isn't just like as an emergency. Ah, things are tough. Times are hard, but yeah, I need, to, I need to come back to God. Follow him closely. Follow him constantly. Don't take your eyes off him. Don't look anywhere else. Look to Jesus. I had the privilege and honour yesterday um, of pacing. She's gone. Young Anna at the park run. She had a target, she had a goal in mind. She wanted to break the, the mythical 25 minute barrier. And the, the one thing I said to her, I said, Anna, follow me like glue. Because I knew I was going to run it in time. She just had to follow me. I'd urge you, follow Jesus closely. Stick to him like glue. Don't let him out of your sight. Don't let him out of your mind. It's so easy, isn't it? There's so many distractions in the world these days. I have so many rants on my dog today about modern social media but I'm not going to but there's just so many things to distract us so many different ways to make us think about anything other than Jesus I'd urge you just consider what is it that keeps you from Jesus what is it that makes it harder for you to follow Jesus because these things can come in many different guises many different distractions many different priorities that take us away from Jesus. Can anything good come from Nazareth? I hope you would conclude with me today that the most amazing person, Jesus Christ, fully man, fully God, was born in Nazareth, came to earth, lived, died for us, rose again, is seated at the right hand of our Father in heaven, Something very good came from Nazareth.
We must follow him today. Follow him for the rest of our lives. Let's make it our goal this week just to really grapple with how can we follow Jesus more. Amen. Steve, you've got, got a song for us, I would imagine. Awesome. I say, if, if any of this is confusing, or if you think, I want to follow Jesus, but I don't know how, and I still don't know how after your 30 minute ramble, then do feel free to talk to me afterwards, or talk to Steve, or talk to someone you know. It's so important that we follow Jesus. So, Steve's going to close uh, in worship.